holy. You have the infants and you have everyone from every class and every category of human beings was welcomed into that university. And for every group and for every class, Imam Hussein offered a role model. For the men, there were 72 of the best humanity could ever provide. For the women, there were the daughters of Rasulullah. For the elderly, there was Habib ibn Mubarak, over 70 years of age. Yet he had, he was like a mountain in his resolve. For the young, there was Al-Qasim ibn Hassan, Abdullah ibn Hassan, only seven years old. And then for the people who had a very pure past, there were companions of the Imam. And people who had a, a bad record, there were also role models for them. A Christian that would revert to Islam. A Uthmani that would love Imam Hussein when he first set his eyes upon him. For the infants, you had Abdullah al For every group, for every class, there was a tutor. And that tutor would teach us that lecture would teach us how to discover our humanity and that is why this university will never perish for as long as there are people that would want to enroll. And your presence here tonight is strong proof that you do want to enroll. That is Imam Hussein, peace and blessings that be upon him and that is why we keep coming back for more. That is why we love him. We love him because he was love personified. We love him because he was worship personified. We love him because he was servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala personified. And that's why we keep coming back. And that's why we interact. That's why we weep. We weep. That's why we cry. That's why we love him. And we love him to death. As much as they tried to, to destroy Imam Hussein and to defeat him, Imam Hussein was killed. He was then decapitated. His body was then crushed by the horses. And it was prevented from being buried so that it would be consumed by the vultures and by wild animals in the desert. The shrine and mausoleum of Imam Hussein was destroyed and demolished several times by successive rulers. People were prevented and barred from paying their tributes and respects to Imam Hussein by visiting him. At the time of that same Khalid that I mentioned his name in Mutawakir al Abbasi, people were, it was, a, it was a huge surge of people visiting Imam Hussein. And so, to prevent them from doing so, what he did was impose a task that every ten people had to have one person from that group be named. In other words, have their hands chopped off, for example. One out of every ten people had to be named. But seeing that the surge of visitors to Imam Hussein's mausoleum wasn't decreasing at all, in fact it was increasing, he increased the penalty several times until it reached a capital punishment for every one out of, out of, out of every two people. So if you and I wanted to visit Imam Hussein at that time, one of us would have to be killed. Now why would anyone do that? Put yourself in their position. Why would you give your life the ultimate price so that someone else would visit Imam Hussein? Well, the answer is that in the hearts and minds of those men and women, those devout Muslims and lovers of Imam Hussein, they were not giving their lives, they were gaining them. And they were also contributing towards guaranteeing the existence and the continuation of Imam Hussein's message. They were not giving lives, they were taking them. They could guarantee by doing so, being in the companionship of Imam Hussein in paradise for eternity. That's why they did it. When Saddam came, he ruled Iraq for about 30 years with an iron fist. He turned Iraq into a maximum security prison, a fortress where people were afraid not to be afraid of him. And one of the things that he did was prevent people from visiting Imam Hussein's mausoleum. In fact, there are official government documents, official government documents, court documents, that state the reason for the execution of one follower of Abu Bakr in Iraq, because he visited the mausoleum of Imam Hussein on a constant basis, and also he never respected Ba'thi agents. In other words, he never said hi to them when they, when they walked past in the street. So for two reasons he was executed. One, 
He didn't respect the Ba'ati agents enough, two, because he visited Imam Hussein's shrine on a constant basis. As much as they, they tried to defeat Imam Hussein, as much as they tried and tried to stop people from loving him, they had been unsuccessful. And the successive generations have come and gone, and each new generation tries successfully to get a sense of direction from Imam Hussein's correction. Which is why the tragedy of Karbala continues to be an area where people cry. Now, I don't expect, nor do I encourage you, to accept everything I have to say to you in these upcoming nights, inshallah. I don't want you to accept everything I say based on religious extremism. I don't even encourage you to do that. I mean, we live in the information age where the most precious commodity is knowledge. People don't take things for granted anymore. People ask you for proof to back up everything you say. And I'm not telling you you should be a skeptic Muslim that questions everything that's put forth. Because there's a difference between questioning everything and trying to gain an understanding. And I would encourage you to ask questions. If there is any area of ambiguity, I would ask you to ask me a question. Tell me what this means. Tell me why this happened. Tell me why this took place. And we're not afraid of being asked questions. He is afraid who does not have the answers. But we have the answers. Maybe I don't, but sure as hell our imams do. A sister once sent me a message. She threatened me by saying that uh, I will convert to Christianity if I don't find the answers to these questions. And I said to her, you know, I think the problem is you haven't looked hard enough. Simply because you haven't found the answers doesn't mean that the answers don't exist. Now you should ask me. If I don't have the answers, you should ask my teachers. If you're not satisfied with their answers, you should ask the, you should ask the Supreme Religious Jurist, the Maraja. And if that doesn't work for you, I will personally join you in becoming Christians. In fact, I will consider joining the ministry, becoming a priest, and probably giving sermons about Jesus at the church. I probably think they even pay better over there. And, uh, you know, simply because you haven't found the answer doesn't mean it's not out there. And I think it's really important in these coming nights, uh, and, and I will base my prime focus on the verse that I began this lecture with. A verse that, if you notice that if you were here last year, we talked about death, and that was very appropriate in my view. It was very important to talk about death. As a reminder that this life is, is a mere transient passage that leads into a, a more important, more fulfilling life. However, I think when it comes to Imam Hussein, we should be talking about life, not death. Imam Hussein is the spring of life. And we should be talking about life and talking about having a good, blessed life. The verse that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture talks about those who do good, be it male or female, men or women. God does not distinguish between, between men and women when it comes to doing good deeds.